this panel with a bunch of very smart people. And uh, I don't know if I belong on this panel, but uh, just to ground this conversation, I'm not an academic in any sort, shape, or form. So I just want to talk about my experience and uh, what I experienced in Sri Lanka this summer and uh, kind of give you some experiential context as to what that could be like for diaspora engagement in Sri Lanka. <coughs> Why are you here? Are you here to take pictures, like the rest of them? What the hell is that going to achieve? I'm tired of telling people like you my story. I'm tired of saying it over and over again with no results. You're coming and going. You come around here, tell people you've been here. What's that going to achieve? Nothing. So what's the point? Here we are, far from our homes, sitting under the hot sun with limited food, here with other mothers bickering for a spot to sleep in. Here we are, asking one question. Where are our children? My healthy son, he looks kind of just like you, they said. They would return him after the checks. I'm still waiting for him to return, just as I sent him in one piece. End quote. We went without cameras and pens. The remark I just recited, it's still fresh in my mind as if I had written it down or memorized it. I've described it to my friends as one of the most realist conversations and rawest moments I've ever had in my life. I don't think I'll ever forget it. Before we went there, a roadside protest in Kilinergy of Amas, whose sons had been made to disappear in the final phases of the war, we were briefed on who we were about to meet. My mind raced as I entered their space, thinking about if my shorts would be considered disrespectful, if the sunglasses on my collar would give off the wrong vibe, or if my untrimmed beard would be looked down upon. I didn't want anything to trigger them or upset them, but what I didn't realize until that moment was that this particular Amma and all of them had very little energy to worry about the things, the trivial things that I was worried about. Here we were, a group of young Tamil diaspora men, resembling the many photos that were pinned across the walls of this tent. Photos that almost felt symbolic in a way, protecting Amma's sons themselves, protecting Amma's from the elements. Another Amma in the crowd picked up on how nervous I was uh, from that uncensored introduction and ask the others to quiet down. Just a second, let me ask him, why are these guys here? What do they, what do they want to talk about? She looked directly at me. My face flushed with nerves and my eyes holding back tears. I answered, truthfully, I mean, why am I here? Because I've heard your stories told by other people by the media, by NGOs, by academics and researchers, but I wanted to hear it for myself. I didn't tell her this part, but I also wanted to remove any doubt in my mind that something this bad was actually happening, that this was real. I'm not sure how I can help you, or even if I can, but I just want to listen to what you have to say. We're here to hear directly from you. At that moment, there was a calm amongst the Ammas. They nodded with the universal Amma on and began to share their stories one by one, clinging to pictures and article clippings of what they thought to be their sons and the hope that they were alive. Their hopefulness is being, in our minds, uh, sorry, their hopefulness, hope, hopefulness in being reunited with their sons, colliding in our minds with what we assume to be the reality of them being long dead. Growing up in Canada, Tamil diasporic youth have had our own challenges. However, there is no contextualized feeling of fear towards authority or government. It's an afterthought. It's something we've only seen depicted in the news or television. It's only something we've been repeatedly told by our parents who fled exactly that. Hearing stories directly from people experiencing them is a level of understanding that can't be felt in any other way. And so that's where I believe 
based on my experience, is at the core of diasporic youth engagement in Sri Lanka. It really comes down to three things, in my opinion. It's listening to the stories and challenges faced by those living in North and East from them directly. This removes any agenda, any political garbage between the storyteller and the listener. It's hearing what people have to say, applying it to a self-directed thinking that young people in diaspora are very much capable of. Number two, it's understanding if, if and what role diaspora has to play individually. Through a proper immersive experience and development work, young people can be exposed to a variety of grassroots organizations and initiatives, like some of which we've heard today, and figure out how they're going to play a part. For some, it may also be the realization point and understanding that this work isn't for them. And that's completely okay as well. Thirdly, it's about forming relationships with people, organizations, and communities that can be continuous. The diversity of the work that is going on in the North and East Sri Lanka is almost as diverse as the Tamil people itself. The exploratory elements of programs like Conduit, when I was part of, allow young people to engage with people from different walks of life, expertise, and missions. Finding something that you believe in can be easily done with an approach that lets you gravitate towards whatever you feel like gravitating towards. These relationships aren't something that begin and end over that short period of time that you're there for a week, a week, four weeks, two months. They can be the starting points for an ongoing partnership between you, that person, communities, or the organizations that you want to work with. When these three elements come together, they create an experience-driven motivation for young Tamil diaspora to stay engaged. It helps them define what and how they will contribute to the development and people and in which region. I now want to share some experiences of the work that some of our volunteers of Conduit got into this summer. Firstly, my own. I spent four weeks uh, in my placement at Conduit. My role was a bit different uh, from the other placements. I was a digital storyteller for the organization itself, so my role was to follow some of the other interns and see what sort of impacts they were having, what sort of organizations they were working with. And for me, for someone born here and raised here, um, it was an eye-opening experience on many levels. But I also got to understand the complexities of diasporic engagement on a personal level. I had the opportunity to get to know the volunteers on a personal level and understand what they were experiencing, challenges they were facing, and more importantly, what they were learning along the way. Through photos, video, written content, I've been sharing a few of these stories and overarching themes in an effort to encourage more diaspora engagement, whether it's with Conduit or with other organizations. Next slide. This is uh, one of our volunteers with Conduit as well. Raj is a city planner from Edmonton, Alberta. This was his first time in Sri Lanka. During his placement, he helped plan and build uh, a kulab area or water reservoir within a community space in Manan. This is Siv. Siv is a city planner in Melbourne, Australia. He was born in, Rain, uh, sorry, born in Sri Lanka and left at, I think, the age of four. And he also worked uh, on an infrastructure project building a children's park in Manan. Next slide. Lawson. Lawson is a law student uh, from the University of Windsor and was born and raised in Toronto. His placement was one of the most challenging ones in Puduhuripu, uh, which was, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, where the end of the war sort of happened. Um, and he spent two months in Sri Lanka teaching and working with youth in that area. And Sai. Sai is a health management professional from Toronto who was born in Sri Lanka but came to Canada at the age of four. This was his first trip back to Sri Lanka where he spent uh, a month as a leadership facilitator in Bentikilo. Now it's purely coincidental that all the volunteers who were there during when I was there were all men. Uh, there are women who are volunteering and uh, from Congo itself we have uh, 
Uh, no Shani, who is going uh, later this year, was a performing arts instructor uh, and being placed in Mexico, and others who will be going later this year in 2018. It is vital to the success of programs like Conduit and others that there is an equal and diverse representation of diaspora. Of course, there are unique challenges that face women, some of which we've heard today in these places. However, it's not impossible, as you've also heard today. In my journey throughout, I've met many women who started off with short-term stints, like the ones provided by Conway, to get an idea of where they'd like to work or play a part in the development of work, and have returned for longer term with organizations and people that align to their values. These not only help the empowerment of women, but break down social constructs that oppress female thought leadership and impact in Tamil communities. Young Tamil diaspora has the power and thinking to challenge these ideologies through meaningful conversations, relationships, and support. Thank you for listening today. I hope I added some value to this conversation, and I hope that through my work, I can engage more members of our community to do bigger and better things, because the reality is, if Tamil diaspora isn't there, somebody else will be.